Hi, I'm Mo Maduro, and this is the Active Life Over 50 Podcast, providing insights and support for your life expansion and self-actualization journey. Today's episode is goal setting. Not all goals should be smart, and other distinctions to supercharge your goal setting. Today, we're going to talk about some of the success principles from way back in the day, and they're still valid today. I don't mean to put it like that, but this podcast is really geared to people who are over 50. Everybody's welcome, but the conversation is, a, is, is directed at people who are over 50, and you know, we've had to learn to navigate seamlessly between analog and, and digital, and a lot of our conditioning, all of our conditioning happened in an analog world. And we've had to layer on the learning part in the digital world. I think there's a lot of advantages there. Uh, some of the cognitive biases that exist in society, I, I think if you did a study, you would find that there's different cognitive biases for people over 50 versus the ones who are under. Uh, you know, we've had to think a lot more. We didn't, we, we weren't smart just because we had a computer in our hand or a phone in our hand, right? We had to either remember the stuff or look it up. The Dewey Decimal System in the library, everybody remembers that. TV commercials, you went from seven channels, and then in the 70s slash 80s, we went to like 100 cable channels, and then we went to on and on. So anyway, the point of this is I want to unpack some of the principles that we're aware of and were touted from the 60s and 70s. I mentioned on an earlier podcast that I used to sell self-development, personal development books and tapes, mainly for small business people and salespeople. And the basis was goal setting, but then strategies to achieve those goals. So goal setting has always been a part of it. I, I, and I used to quote the same study that I see today, that the 3% of the people were independently wealthy. 10% were doing very well financially. Another 60% were, were getting by okay. And then 27% needed support to survive. Now, when they did the pull the covers back, the difference was that the 3% that were independently wealthy had goals that were written and clearly crystallized, whereas the 10% the ten that were doing very well had goals generally in mind, and the 60% didn't really have goals. Um, they had goals, but they weren't written down, and they had to do with things like vacation, and then 27% that needed support to survive had no goals at all. So that same study is still talked about today. I, you know, they they literally followed the people around for, uh, not followed them around, but they tracked them. They tracked their progress and results in life, I think, over a 20 or 30 year period. And that's how they came out with that. I don't know if those numbers are still exact today. I think that the, you know, the 3% is probably skewed because the 1% has so much of the wealth compared to the three. But the point is that goal setting, despite all of the teachings, all of the work around goal setting for years and years, I'm not sure that it's translated into better results. Now, I've gotten into debates with people about you should tell, your, tell people your goals, announce them, and there's another argument that you should not. And I've looked at both sides of this. I can argue both sides, and I think there's a time for and a time against. But I also think it has a lot to do with the temperament of the person. If a person likes pressure, they thrive under pressure, telling other people makes sense. If they're an ext extrovert and they like that interaction, maybe that makes more sense. The introvert, they don't want people all up in their business. Maybe those folks want it. So I think that there's other factors. You can't just say right or wrong. Uh, I do think you want to test it for yourself, but there's different kinds of goals. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, because for all of the success principles, you have to understand what goes wrong when it doesn't work and also understand what goes right when it does work and then start to slice and dice that so you can get beneath what it is because sometimes we're focused on the leaves and not even seeing the branches let alone the trunk and the roots so you want to understand what's the, what's at the roots i should tell a quick story why this is all fascinating to me when i was 5 years old i decided i wanted to learn how to ride my my two wheeler i took the training wheels off crashed and burned put them back on. I was very mechanically inclined as a kid. I used to build bicycles later on after that, but motorcycles, building choppers and stuff. So it was no big deal to take training wheels off as a five-year-old. And I had to put them back on. And then I tried again. And, and then my sister told me that she heard this thing or saw this thing or someone told her that, and she was only two years old. She was seven. She said, if you, if, if you say, I know I can, I know I can, I know I can, you'll be able to do it. Well, I'm five years old and she's my big sister. You know, it's like, 
Of course, I, I'm going to listen. So I'm running around the house in the morning. I know I can. I know I can. I know I can. I took the training wheels off and I rode the bike. First time. And, and so as a five-year-old, that stuck in my head. Like, okay, this thing is pretty cool. So obviously I tried it on a lot of things and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And that led to a life of digging beneath this stuff. So it never was fascinating just to get the outcome. It was always fascinating to see why it worked. And it took me down all kinds of paths with the books, so many books, hundreds and hundreds of books. So I ended up selling the, the development programs for Success Motivation International because I, I just had to keep learning and learning and learning. And it took me to neurolinguistic programming. And I studied the law of attraction, some of the metaphysical stuff. And um, by the way, the short version on that is I... I, after looking at all of that, I decided, because I argued all the different sides, to make the Bible the owner's manual for my life. And I can map all of this, not all of it, most of it back to Proverbs. And I'll do that in a subsequent episode. I'll start mapping some of these principles back to Proverbs, because it's, it's all there. So anyway, so my thing was always, why does it work? See, when you have an airplane, if you have the right speed and you've got the, the right conditions, it's going to fly every single time. It's not a sometimes thing, right? On a motorcycle, if you pop the clutch at a certain RPM, it's going to do a wheelie every single time, unless the ground is, is slick, and then the rear wheel will spin. But my point is, when it doesn't work, there's an obvious reason why it didn't work. With the, all the law of attraction, with the neuro-linguistic programming, with the success, success principles, the positive mental attitude, the I can, I can, I can, the affirmations, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And so I've dug into why it didn't, and that's how I would test it. And so anyway, goal setting and some of the factors that I think people may have missed as to why goal setting didn't work for them. So first of all, it has to be clear. Now, this thing about smart, it has to be smart. Not necessarily. It should be smart. Now, on the smart, so in Success Motivation International, we were in, a, in the headquarters in Waco. Me and a few other distributors were in Waco literally debating, trying to come up with the words for the acronym SMART, you know, SMART goals. And this was in 1981, 1980, going through. And we were going through, you know, specific, measurable. We would get stuck and go back and forth. Should it be achievable or should it be aggressive? And back and forth and then realistic and then relevant. And we'd go back and forth. And we never did like the T because we would say time bound or target dates. And, you know, we kind of went out of there with it open-ended. But, you know, we all used it in our own way. 15 years later, in the mid-90s, I see SMART come up. Now, I don't know, there's probably multiple groups working on this thing at different times, and I just thought that was interesting that I didn't see anything on it for 15 years, and all of a sudden, I see it coming out in some training. But all goals don't need to be SMART, and, I, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. Introverts versus extroverts, or maybe there's some other factors why it's good to publish it, publicize your goals and why it may not be good. The other one I think is a, worth mentioning, I've not seen this written anywhere, is you know, Myers-Briggs, so you've, you've taken that, you've got uh, 16 different boxes and you end up with four letters and it's, so it's the first one is either in, extrovert or introvert, the next one is intuitor or sense, so that's the N and the S, and the next one is thinker or feeler, and the last one is perceiver or judge. So you might be an ENTP, for example, extrovert, intuitor, thinker, and perceiver. E and I is pretty self-explanatory. What I like to think of in terms of extrovert, extrovert, introvert is just look at behavior. People who get around other need to get around other people to recharge, they're probably more likely extroverts. People who want to be on their own, probably more likely introverts. I'm an introvert. You know, my my thing is if I get on a motorcycle and I ride 12 hours inside my helmet, hey, that's that's bliss. Being on a mountain bike trail out in nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, just cruising on the mountain bike trails, you know, near death experiences. As an introvert, that's the great way to recharge. Extroverts would always want to be around other people. On the I'll skip the N and the S for a moment. The thinker and feelers, pretty, pretty straightforward. One is looking at the logic, the numbers, bottom line. The other one is thinking about the people. What does this do for the people? And then the last one, perceiver and judge the perceiver is more abstract, thinking uh, more conceptual. And the judge is going to be organizing it, making lists, uh, less free form. The P is more free form and kind of nonlinear. There's a way to think about it. 
So the N and the S is the big story because the N and the S is where biggest the biggest breakdowns in business come through. So I mentioned building high performing teams. I've had 15 teams over the 30 years and probably somewhere two thirds into that, a little less than that, I started having every time I had a team, I would have my direct reports go through Myers-Briggs and I would organize the work around Myers-Briggs. And that was a big reason why I was able to repeat the behavior over and over because I relied on something that was pretty solid. And you can take Myers-Briggs today as free. There's a, a smaller, smaller version, but it'll still tell you what you are. But I used to go through the whole workshop with a trained facilitator, certified facilitator come out and they'd go through this. And one of the exercises was to put the N's and the S's in groups and have them do work through some problems, some case studies. And it showed me now again, so I've gone through this thing probably seven or eight times total, Myers Briggs. And every single time you can see the huge breakdown in the N and the S. So what is it? It's not capability and it's not skill set. It has to do with the preference for how they receive and articulate information. So the N is more conceptual and abstract thinker, likes to be, and that sounds like the P, but it's not. It, it's more conceptual and big picture first. It doesn't mean that the N can't look at the detail in the small picture of the concrete, but they want to see the big picture first, and then they can make sense of the, of, of the detail. The S, on the other hand, wants to see the detail in the concrete first, and then they can make sense of seeing the big picture. Another example, the N might be more concerned if you're, you're, you know, chopping wood in the forest, chopping your way through a path in the forest. The ends want to focus on where's the direction of the path going? Which are, are we going in the right direction? Uh, what's up ahead? And the S is, you know, going to be paying attention to, man, if we keep the axes sharpened, if we sharpen them at this time interval, it's going to be more effective. You need both. You need both. And one is not better than the other. You need both. It's, and it's not even that one can't do the other. It's the preference of the sequence. The N wants to see the big picture first. The S wants to see the concrete first. Unlike the other three elements or the other three categories, the E and the I, they know they need each other. The, the finance in, introvert guy knows that they need the sales guy to get the, the revenue coming in. The thinker feeler, they know they've got to balance the people with with the objective. And the perceiver and judger, yeah, it's great to have all these ideas, but at some point you've got to get, get it down to an organized project. So all of those know that they need the other. The breakdown, the reason why the N and the S is the largest breakdown in business is because they don't really, it's not, it's not obvious that they need each other. They actually think that this is the way to go, to, to follow um, the way it's always been done, which tends to be the S, and the N is always looking at trying to do a new thing. If you have, if you're a leader and you have ends in an S organization, take some time with them because they're going to be stressed out. And they're okay, but understand that they're under stress because they're constantly being given signals that they don't know what they're doing, they're wrong thinking, et cetera. Same thing with the S. If you are an N organization and you have some, you have just a few S's, pay attention to them, take some time with them because they're going to be stressed out because the, the signals are that they don't know what they're doing. If you want to organize the work and assign work, think about ends running projects. Give them the big projects and the S's leaning towards operational. Now, you can't cut it that cut. It's not that cut and dry, but it's a bias. And if you're putting your best S, your best operational leader, and you put them in charge of running a project, it's going to be a challenge for them. You could take a mid-tier leader who's an N and put them in charge of a project and you'll get a great result. Same thing in reverse. You have the great project manager. This person's fantastic. You put them in charge of an operational situation. And we've all seen this. We've all seen this. And this is not the Peter principle. This is just has to do with, with preferences. By the way, I was talking about un, the unconscious in a prior episode. And the Peter principle is a real good illustration. The Peter principle essentially says you're going to get promoted to a point that's just one step beyond what you can handle. And when you look at it from a conditioning standpoint, it's very clear what's going on. The good news is that neuroplasticity, neurobiology, epigenetics all tell us that the gene expression in the brain that we're born with is not the one we have to die with. So we can change this stuff. When you're talking about goals, what does all this mean with respect to goals? Project goals 
need a different set of inputs than operational goals. Operational goals can be sort of improvement goals, whereas project goals are sort of creation goals. And you want to manage them differently. And sometimes we just, and so on a SMART goal, it's a lot easier to have a SMART goal, specific, measurable, attain, uh, aggressive, but realistic and time bound. It's easier to have a SMART goal or more effective to have a SMART goal on a, an improvement or an operational type setting. If you're creating something brand new, it does not exist. It's very difficult to have a SMART goal because it's n you have no, no basis. You can have vision and you can have gating and you can have touch points. But if you try to get too detailed with the SMART, you're cutting off a lot of opportunity because you're in the unknown. And when you're in the unknown, you have infinite possibility and you want to stretch into that. This is why the vision people will argue, no, you don't want a SMART goal. You want to have a vision and just go in the direction and look for the signposts and, and adjust as you go. And I agree with them on the creation goals. And the bigger the creation goal, and we'll get into that when we start talking about breaking through and operating in the unknown, is you've got to have a different approach, field of infinite possibility. The last part I'm going to talk about is why, is goals, why does goal setting work? I can go on and on. We can talk about priming. We can talk about intention, uh, putting it out there. But I, everything I talk about, I want to break it down into science where I can explain it from a very logical scientific provable standpoint and I don't have any woo-woo. So anything I'm talking about, there's no woo-woo gap here. I can, I can close that gap between inputs and outputs, at least partially. Now, I can't tell you all this stuff, obviously, but that's what I'm not going to be talking about. I will be talking about what it does do. So goal setting allows you to create some pictures and pictures talk to your unconscious. Uh, goal setting allows you to visualize and we know visualization works. I'm going to talk about it, that in the next episode. But one of the big things that goal setting does is it puts your reticular activating system, and I'll use that term a lot, but I'm just going to call it the RAS. It puts the reticular activating system on alert that it should pay attention to these particular types of things because you have a goal. And by putting the RAS on alert, you're going to see more. Remember, the unconscious in the brain can process 11 million bits per second. The conscious mind can only process 50 bits per second. So we're constantly being filtered. You walk into a room, you're only going to see a very, very small part of it. But when the reticular activating system is attuned to the goals that you have, you start, you're going to start seeing more opportunity. The other thing that goal setting does is it gives you context to, to have something that you can write down every day. And if you're writing the goal down, and I do agree with that, you write down your top two or three goals every single day, write them down and think about them. Because now you're priming yourself. You're priming yourself to look for those opportunities. And I'm going to talk about this in visualization. But when you're priming yourself to look and expect those opportunities, when they show up, they don't always look obvious. But when they show up, you'll see them because you recognize them. And that's a big part of visualization, not the only part. So goal setting provides the context so that some of these other things can come into play and can come into work. This is not the end of it. We'll talk about goal setting more, but uh, goal setting is a is a major part. I've covered three things. I, I talked about the difference between telling people about your goals and not telling them and, and what that, and, and when a vision is, is more important. To, so rather than just talk project or operation, I wanted to also think about creation goals versus improvement goals. So that's a little bit different than project because I can have a project goal that's also improvement. But when you're talking about creation goals, you're in the infinite, if you're in the field of infinite possibility, that's a different deal. And then we talked about the priming and being able to see some of those clues that come up. Now, that's not a difference. The other ones were differences, but when you can start seeing some of the, the opportunities. And then the last one I'm going to talk about, or not talk about, but bring up, is that in the 80s, they discovered that some of those neurons, you know, the 100 billion neurons, and we don't know how many, but there's mirror neurons, and the mirror neurons are responsible for the empathy. If you've ever been running or skiing or something like that, doing a trick or on skateboards or whatever, and, and while you're in the midst of something, you see somebody fall and you'll sort of stumble. That's those mirror neurons. That's the mirror neurons at work. Uh, the mirror neurons have a lot to do with the emotional intelligence. They allow us to feel what our, what the person we're across from is feeling. And so there's, and it's hard to test this, right? The scientists are, are working through it. But you can see how mirror neurons can actually have an effect of communicating what your needs are 
to somebody who's across the room. And so there is this serendipity that, that happens, and it could be tracked back to mirror neurons. I don't know, and I'm not going to say one way or the other, but it's certainly directional. And that's as far as I'll go, because again, I don't want to have any woo-woo. But look up mirror neurons and make your own, your, your own decision. All right, we'll see you next time. <laughs>